Well, good morning, everyone. Give you a very warm welcome to worship today, and we offer an especially warm welcome to anyone joining us online for the first time and to everyone who is joining us online. We hope that we might be able to sing today, but unfortunately in Renfrewshire we're still in level three, I think it is, and two, but we need to get down to level one to be able to sing, so unfortunately no singing. If you want to sing, you've only got to go as far as the Inverclyde boundary, and you can sing so long as you're facing into Inverclyde. So if you want to do that, you, if you want to imitate Maria from The Sound of Music, you know, you could run along and I can just see a lot of you doing that actually. But um, maybe in a couple of weeks' time we'll be able to sing. So um, today would have been our communion Sunday. Uh, we've been saying this for <laughs> several months now um, uh, and we decided we would delay it partly because Graham is away and uh, partly because we thought there might be more chance of having a normal communion service. So we're going to have communion in Freeland on the 20th of June, so that's two weeks' time. But in St. Macker's, our friends, they're having communion today, and they're having the evening communion service at 7 o'clock, which is a joint service. And if you want to come along to the evening service in St. Macker's at 7, then you're very welcome to do that. You don't have to book in advance. You can just come along and sign in on the night. So that's tonight at 7 o'clock. Um, in two weeks' time, we'll do it all again, but um, we'll do it in Freeland in the morning. So uh, just to let you know about that. Um, today, we're looking at Joel chapter 1. We're beginning a new series in the book of Joel, and we'll be looking at Joel chapter 2, the first half of that next Sunday morning. Wednesday night in the midweek meeting, we're going to start a series in the letter to the Philippians, and we're going to read the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 1 uh, on Wednesday night. So I think that's all we need to say by way of introduction. So let's turn to God's praise. We're going to sing perhaps one of the most familiar hymns in Scotland, one of the, the favorite hymns of many people, I to the hills will lift mine eyes. Well, the book of Joel is about a famine in Israel, a famine in Israel probably in the 9th century um, BC, and the famine was caused by a plague of locusts. Now, I don't know if anyone knows anything about locusts. Does anyone know what a locust is? What is a locust? An insect that eats things, right? Well, it's not as simple as that. 
Does anyone know what a locust actually is? A locust is actually a grasshopper. So you're all nodding now. I knew that. I knew that. I knew that. I knew that. So, but it's a kind of grasshopper which swarms. And grasshoppers don't normally swarm, but periodically they swarm, usually when there's been a long dry period and then a short wet period, and you get a swarm of locusts. Now, we're going to find out all about locusts now. We've got a video that lasts 3 minutes and 34 seconds, and it's all about locusts. There is no other species on the planet that responds as quickly and as dramatically to the good times as the desert locust. Eggs that have remained in the ground for 20 years begin to hatch. The young locusts are known as hoppers. For at this stage, they're flightless. They find new feeding grounds by following the smell of sprouting grass. Normally, it takes four weeks for hoppers to become adults. But when the conditions are right, as now, their development switches to the fast track. As the vegetation in one place begins to run out, the winged adults release pheromones, scent messages, which tell others in the group that they must move on. And when groups merge, they form a swarm. eats its entire body weight every day, and a whole swarm can consume literally hundreds of tons of vegetation. They have to keep on moving. The swarm travels with the wind. It's the most energy-saving way of flying. Following the flow of wind means that they're always heading toward areas of low pressure. Places where wind meets rain and vegetation starts to grow. As they fly, swarms join up with other swarms to form gigantic plagues several billion strong and as much as 40 miles wide. They will consume every edible thing that lies in their path. This is one of planet Earth's greatest spectacles. It's rarely seen on this scale, and it won't last long. Once the food has gone, the steady roar of a billion beating locust wings will once again be replaced by nothing more than the sound of the desert. Well, there you are. You don't say you don't get an educational experience when you come to Freeland. And, uh, that is exactly what happened in Israel 2,900 years ago when the prophet Joel was alive. And just as we saw in that film, what they, the locusts do is they, they fly to where the crops are just starting to grow. So everything is eaten when it's young. And so there's nothing left to grow. When the swarm of locusts has devoured everything, there is literally nothing left. And remember what I said at the beginning, 
The conditions that they need are a long, dry spell and then a sudden wet spell. So we've had a long, dry spell for perhaps years, less rain than normal. That means that the crops have been less abundant than normal for a long time. So not able to save up, to store away, to keep crops. And suddenly, there is nothing left. We can do a lot about it now because people have got chemicals they can use to spray locusts, for example. They know when they're going to come and they spray the little uh, aphids when they're still small. And we don't tend to get the same absolutely devastating plagues of locusts now that we did in biblical times. But there was a big plague, I think, in the 1960s in North Africa, which devastated several countries in agriculture. So it still happens, but it used to happen far more often than it does now. And what Joel is saying is that in this case, this is a natural phenomenon, but it's a natural phenomenon which God is using to teach his people a lesson. And it seems to me there could be no better book for us to study at the moment because what's going on all around us, a natural phenomenon, but is God teaching us a lesson through it? So that's going to be part of the theme of our study in the book of Joel. I'll say more in the introduction a bit later on, but that's part of what we'll be thinking about over the next four or five weeks. Well, we're going to turn to God's prayer, uh, God's praise again. We're going to sing a hymn which we've never had before. And I've known about this hymn for years. And for the first time, I thought we should sing this hymn because it fits in perfectly. And I said to Graham, we've got a new song. He said, I was singing that when I was in the youth groups. So it's been around for at least 15 years. <laughs> One shall tell another. One shall tell another, and he shall tell his friend. Husbands, wives, and children shall come following on. From house to house in families shall more be gathered in. And lights will shine in every street so warm and welcoming. Come on in and taste the new wine. The wine of the kingdom, the wine of the kingdom. of the Father is ready now to flow. Through acts of love and mercy we must let it show. He turns now from his anger to show a smiling face. And long that men should stand beneath the fountain of his grace. Come on in and taste the new wine. The wine of the kingdom. The wine of the kingdom of God. Invitation comes to us, it's yours and it is mine. Come on in and taste the new wine, the wine of the kingdom, the wine of the kingdom of God. He gives healing and forgiveness, the wine of the kingdom, the wine of the kingdom of God. swaying to that one, really, shouldn't we? We should all be swaying to that one. Well, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray together.
Oh, our Father, that's a, an image which is used in so many different parts of the Scriptures, the, the image of new wine, the image of new life, the image of new beginning. And Father, it's such a wonderful image which is presented to us that a, a people like the people of Israel who seem almost ageless, or the church of Jesus Christ, which seems to have been around forever, can feel the new life, can drink the new wine of the kingdom. And as we come into your presence to worship you today, our Father, we are very conscious that it is so easy for our faith to become something which is routine, something which we take for granted, something which is fixed in our minds. We have what we have. We believe what we believe. We do what we do. And we are not open to new things and to new ways and to the breath of life which we often sing might come sweeping through us. And so as we come to worship you this morning, we are conscious that we live in days which in so many ways are like new days. Many people speak of a new normal. And for some of us, it's become almost conditioned in us that when we enter a building, we put on a mask. That when we see com someone coming towards us, we step aside to let them pass. We spend more time at home than ever before and have less engagement with people than we have ever had in our lives. And we hear our father stories of families who live in different parts of the country or different parts of the world. We haven't seen each other face to face for nearly two years. And we recognize, Father, that we live in new times, but not times we would really want to live in. And so our mind turns back nearly 3,000 years to one of those occasions when a country was devastated by a plague and all the food was gone. There was nothing for the cattle to eat, nothing even for the sheep to find in the hills. Everything had been devoured, and there was no grain even to form the seed for the coming year. And all around was darkness, all around was despair. And in the midst of that, you called Joel to prophesy your word. And as he spoke about the situation he found and the reality which he saw all around him, he caught a glimpse of who you are and what it is you long to do in the lives of your people. As he spoke about old men, dreaming dreams, young children catching vision. And so we pray as we gather to worship you this morning, that surrounded as we are by the reality of pandemic, that we would nevertheless catch the sight of the glorious kingdom, the glorious kingdom of God, we would catch an understanding of your purity and your goodness and your love and your faithfulness, your faithfulness in good times and in bad, and that we would hold on to that faith. Indeed, that faith would grow and strengthen even when the world cries out to us, where is your God? And Father, we recognize that there are many people, people even in the church, whose faith has been challenged by the events of the last year and a bit. Many people who have become disillusioned because it seems as if God is not hearing or answering 
their prayers. And we acknowledge, Father, that what we want is what we think is best, what we think is right. And often that's because that makes life easier for us and better for us. And we ask our Father that you would give us today that humility and faithfulness which when we come before you in prayer is ready to hear the answer, no, wait, listen, look to me. We pray, our Father, that we would do that, that in these days our focus would not just be on all the statistics which rain out every day, but our focus would be on the one who is God alone and who is working out his purpose until that day dawns and we see Jesus face to face. So we continue to pray for everyone who is involved in dealing with the pandemic and trying to plan the way ahead, for everyone who is engaged in research, for everyone who is, who is making and distributing vaccine and trying to grow the number available so that across the world everyone can be vaccinated and as quickly as possible. And our Father, we do pray that where we have a part to play in slowing down the spread of the virus, that we would be willing to play that part even after such a long time. So we ask that you would be with us in our time together. This would be a time when we grasp a sense of your glory and your power and your goodness and your unchanging faithfulness. And our Father, we bring our prayers in the wonderful name of Jesus. And in his words, we join together as we say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again to God's praise in the hymn, I the Lord of Sea and Sky.
Good morning, everyone. This morning's reading from God's Word comes from the book of Joel, and we're reading the whole of the first chapter. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days? or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail, because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, The grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Despair, you farmers, wail, you vine growers, grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered, the pomegranate, the palm and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offering and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. 
It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down, for the grain has dried up. How the cattle moan, the herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the open pastures and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up and fire has devoured the open field. The Lord bless to us this reading from his word. And we'll now sing when all around is fading. Uh, as you will see, the, the rules have relaxed a little bit uh, and that we can now have three people singing uh, with appropriate uh, precautions in, 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 in a music group. Um, so it won't be long before we'll all be singing together as a congregation, I'm sure. But as we sing this, do remember that it's perfectly allowable to say the words to yourself uh, and to actually speak the words as, as we sing along uh, with your masks on. Uh, so this is When All Around Is Fading. said last week that uh, we've had the, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. I didn't say very much about what had happened at the General Assembly, but the big thing at the Church of Scotland's General Assembly this year is the same thing as we've had at the General Assembly, I think, every year since I was a child, and it's about retrenchment of the church. It's about reducing the size of the church to fit the availability of the number of ministers we're going to have and also the amount of money that we're going to have. Those of us who are cynical suspect that it's the second rather than the former, which is driving a lot of the, the thinking and the planning. And uh, the, the basic 
fact is that the church has got to reduce the number of ministers by just about 35%. So where there are um, 100 at the moment, there will only be 65 in the new scheme of things. Um, in our presbytery, we are now part of Clyde Presbytery. Clyde Presbytery takes in the former Greenock and Paisley Presbytery and the former Dumbarton Presbytery. So it stretches on either side of the river. We have got 59.8 ministers at the moment. I'm the point eight, I suppose, but uh, 59.8, and we're going to have 40 in the new plan. So that's a slightly smaller reduction than the general reduction, but it's still going to be a big problem. And I expect, you know, just to be perfectly candid, it's difficult to see how at the end of the process we will still have two churches in Bridge of Weir. And that's just, a, uh, just I think, a, an inescapable observation as much as anything else. Um, but the interesting thing was that at the General Assembly, the book which was quoted most was the book of Joel. Not chapter 1, which speaks about the famine, or the first part of chapter 2, which speaks about the, uh, the famine, but the second part of Joel chapter 2, because that's the bit of Joel that we like. It's from verse 28, and afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see vision. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. People were longing for the answer before the question has actually been dealt with. And that struck me that it was an important thing to actually look at the book of Joel. Because the book of Joel speaks about the reality of the world which he faced. Interestingly enough, Joel is a common name in the Old Testament. Apart from the prophet Joel, there are 12 other Joels in the Old Testament. And that could be a quiz question for Freeland News. You know, you're looking for an article, you know, find all the Joels in the Old Testament. There could be a prize for that. Um, I think you could offer a really big prize because I think a lot of us would struggle to find all 12 of the other Joels. But the Joel who's the prophet isn't one of those 12. And the only other place he is mentioned in the Bible is in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and when Peter sees the tongues of fire spreading out and touching the disciples and then the crowd, the crowd suddenly think of those verses in Joel chapter 2, in those days I will pour out my Spirit on all people. So Joel is a book which deals with the reality of the world which he encounters. We don't actually know when Joel lived. Traditionally in the church we felt that he probably was a prophet from the 9th century BC. Some people think he was from the 5th century BC. I don't suppose that 400 years matters particularly, um, but I think the context of the the, the book, I think, is probably right to think of the 9th century BC. Not that I'll be talking much about the 9th century BC because I don't remember it and uh, I can't comment too much on it. But that's when he was probably around. And of course, it helps us to understand that the world, in so many ways, is not as different from 3,000 years ago as we think it might be today. These elemental forces are still with us. A plague of loc locusts, for example. We might be able to control it better today. We might be able to mitigate the effect of a plague of locusts today. But nevertheless, the essential ingredients which create the locust plagues are still with us, and they have been with us for all 3,000 of those years. And when you see what a plague of locusts does, you recognize that Israel was particularly vulnerable to a plague of locusts. Israel is essentially a long, narrow country. And if a plague of locusts emerges at the south or the north, following the low pressure, it will sweep through the whole length of Israel. 
and almost devour everything. Because for large parts of Israel, it is barely wider than 40 miles. And if it follows the fertile part of Israel, then almost everything is destroyed. And there's nothing you can do about it, or you could then, because we saw how quickly they breed, how fast they grow, and how much they eat. Did you hear that statistic in the little video? A male locust eats its body weight in food every single day. Now, I'm looking out at the congregation here, I'm thinking, that would mean that some of you would have to eat maybe eight stones of food every day. Can you imagine that? I can't. I can't begin to imagine that. I couldn't even do it in jelly beans. No, not, not for a moment could I do it even in jelly beans. That's how much they devour. And there is nothing left. And that is what is happening in Israel. Hear this, you elders. Listen to all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children. I was reflecting this week about some of the incidents we had with our children when they were at school. I remember getting a phone call from the school one day to say, you'll have to come and pick up the children because it's so windy that the windows are shaking and we're frightened that the windows will smash and the glass will shatter and you can just imagine the consequences of that. And so I went to pick up the children from school and as we were walking up the hill, we could hardly walk against the wind. It was so strong at, at points. And I said to the children then, you will tell your children about this because you will never experience anything like this again in your lifetime. Well, the following year, I got another phone call from the school because it was so wet. Some of us will remember this day when it was so wet that the village was practically cut off. By this time, Timothy was at secondary school and they were in Johnston that year, if you remember, because they were renovating Greif. And the bus bringing him back got as far as the old garage at the entrance to the village. Couldn't go any further because of the water and just dumped all the children off. And Timothy came home and the water was up to there and his legs because it was so deep. I'd gone down to the primary school to pick up Rebecca and Jonathan. And by the time I got there, you could hardly get into the school. It was like an island surrounded by water. And some of the teachers stayed in the school until every child had been picked up. The last child wasn't picked up, I think, till about half past six. And they all had to go back to Kilmacomb to stay with another teacher because they couldn't get back to their own homes. And as we walked up Horsewood Road and we got to the top, Rebecca and Jonathan had been partly walking, partly I'd been carrying them. And we got to the top of Horsewood Road. Poor Jonathan was walking and the water went right over his wellingtons. <laughs> you know, and I said to them, you will tell your children about this because you will never experience anything like that again in your life. And what happened two years later? Do you remember the snow? Well, in Law Marn at Crescent, it was 14 inches deep, that snow. Remember, it came late. I think it was in April it came, and it was very, very deep. It took two weeks before our road was clear of snow. And I remember going down to the school again, and I think by this stage it was just Jonathan who was at the primary school, and saying to him, you will tell your children about this. You will never experience anything like this again. Now, this is a little place. We get a lot of weather, don't we? And we still talk about these things because they are such a shock to the system. They are so unusual. Generally speaking, for us, life is quite straightforward and easy and normal. But if there is one thing that we will be talking to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren about for years to come, it's this pandemic. We've never experienced anything like it. We couldn't have imagined it, could we? And it's still going on. I was uh, talking to somebody. Uh, I had a wedding yesterday. Caroline Brody, the last of the Brody girls, got married yesterday. So that's all three of them off their, off uh, Ian and Patty's hands. And it was a lovely wedding and they're a lovely family. And uh, 
Ian was just talking about some of the landmarks in the life of their family, but we were just reflecting on what a strange wedding it was. You had to put on your mask. You had to have to the service outside so we could have the necessary numbers. And you could only have so many guests. And it was just a lovely day, beautiful day, but not the occasion we would have wanted. And everything has changed. And we couldn't have envisaged what it was like. I was sitting beside Patty's brother at the reception. And he was saying that he hadn't seen his parents for two years until he was able to come up and see them. And that's the reality that so many families are facing. And our children growing up in this, they'll be able to tell their grandchildren about the great plague of 2020, 2021. And it helps to put into perspective the biblical narrative. Perhaps previous generations, the generation before us maybe, couldn't really have quite understood what it was like for everything to be changed because of some event. But we can understand it. We thought we were in control of everything, didn't we? That there was nothing that we couldn't really stop or contain. But we're not. Just like the wind and the rain and the snow. There are some things which we cannot cope with. And what Joel goes on to say from verse 5, the, the, the passage is really split into, I think, six sections, but we're going to look at uh, five sections. That's section one we've been thinking about, the first four verses. From verses 5 to 12, Joel then says to the people, you've got to waken up. You've got to see what's going on around you. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, drinkers of wine, because it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land. Powerful and without number. Now, the people who think that Joel was prophesying in the 5th century BC, they think that Joel is using the image of locusts to describe the army which is invading Israel or Judah. Because that had been their experience from the 8th century BC, they had constantly been under attack. They had gradually been worn down, first Israel and then Judah. And we had the different armies coming against them, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Romans, the Greeks, you name it. They had come and taken over the land. They were just like locusts. They were like a plague. And that's why some people think that this is a 5th century prophecy. But I think that Joel is prophesying simply into the reality that this nation has invaded their land, powerful and without number. And you see that, don't you, when you think about the film we saw, how these locusts, if you're looking for exponential, that is how they breed and how they grow. You grow from a handful to billions in the course of a few weeks. And they devour everything before them. They've got teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. They lay waste to the vines, to the fig trees. They strip the, the bark from the trees. And there is nothing left. That is the picture. And I think that when the pandemic started, we wondered, didn't we, and we worried that perhaps that would be something like the experience of the Western world. When everything stopped, we wondered how many people would still have jobs at the end of the pandemic. It's actually defied every economic law that we're now in a situation where house prices are growing, where there are some things you can't buy because the demand is outstripping the supply, when inflation is starting to re-emerge in so many ways, and when comparatively few people have lost their jobs, not that we diminish the reality and the problem and the difficulty which that causes 
for the people involved. But we thought it would be far worse, didn't we? We thought there would be millions of people who would lose their jobs. Now we're still supporting people through the furlough scheme and all of that. It looks to me as if the furlough scheme is going to carry on until it can be stopped. We've done our best to mitigate the reality. But nevertheless, at the very least, what some people have lost are effectively years from their lives. I was talking to some parents whose children are at school, and they were all saying, probably the last thing the children wanted to hear, that really it would be better if they could all just repeat this year, because they've lost so much. And some children have lost so much more than others, but they've lost so much. And I said, well, if everyone repeated the year, then the whole world would lose a year, wouldn't they? And I was hearing just yesterday that, if you remember a few months ago, they announced that all the dental students would have to repeat their final year because they hadn't had any practice. They're wondering what to do with students who are going into teaching because they've not been able to have the same amount of practice. And are they going to be able to go into schools next year without having had that practice? Or are they going to have to get the practice first? And if they have to get the practice first, then Dave's going to have to take two classes because there aren't going to be enough teachers. That's the reality. All these problems that people are having to sort out and fix, we thought they would be far worse. What we have endured, in a sense, has been something of a miracle. That things have been so good compared to what they might have been like. And there's a sense in which, even in the midst of this pandemic, we as Christians should be giving thanks that God has stayed to a certain extent, if you like to use that image, His hand. But nevertheless, it has been hard. And it's been almost intolerable for some people at some points. And what Joel says is that we need to do two things. We need to understand and grieve what is happening. And we need to turn to God in repentance. And I wonder if that's one of the things we have not really talked about very much in the church during the course of this pandemic. We've been good at the positive stuff. We've been good at the kindly, thoughtful, supporting sort of stuff. But we haven't really asked a big question. Is God speaking to us in this? And if he is, what is he saying to us? And how do we respond to him? And so often in the world today, it seems to me that we are able to deflect, if you like, the challenge which God lays on us by deflecting it to other people. So we blame people for all the problems that we face. They're not our problems. They're their problems. That's one of the reasons to have a government, isn't it? You've got a government, you can blame the government. We've got so many governments, you can blame almost everybody. Or you can blame the system. Or you can blame the bureaucracy. And so often that is what we do rather than examining ourselves and asking what God is teaching us and saying to us. And Joel, when he comes to say to the people what they should do, this is what he says in verse 13. This is the third section, actually. It's just a single verse, this section. Put on sackcloth, O priests, and mourn, Wail, you who minister before the altar. Now, you've got a minister who wails, but he does it when he's singing. So, I do it all the time. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. And as I said in several articles in Freeland News last year, one of the miracles of this pandemic is that that has not actually happened in the church. Last year, our income went up. 
nobody could come to the church, but the income went up. That maybe tells you something. It was incredible how generous people were because we saw that as a priority, I think. But that wasn't true in every congregation. And that's one of the things, I think, which is driving this new wave of reorganization in the church. Because it has shown the church how vulnerable many congregations are. It has just taken one huge problem to illustrate that there are many churches which are simply unable to provide for themselves. And when it comes to the the church, when it comes to the temple worship, all of that has had to stop because there is simply no money available. I was talking to one of my colleagues this week, one of my colleagues who's finding it quite difficult, who's finding everything is getting on top of them, really, I think, phoned me to be cheered up. Of course, told him to phone somebody else, but, you know, and he phoned me, and he was talking about his congregation, and there are suggestions to do things, you know, to improve things, to, to do different things, to, 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 to use the church's reserves to build and to grow. And people are arguing Should we use the reserves or should we keep them for a rainy day? And I said to him, well, if this isn't a rainy day, we're never going to experience a rainy day. And I said, what you should tell your congregations is great because you can tell your colleagues to tell the congregation what you think they should be hearing. Whether you'd necessarily do that yourself is another matter. I said, you need to tell them that if they're not careful, they'll be closed down and the reserves will go to another congregation. So, it might be better to start investing them and using them to grow. But there's a question for every single one of us, isn't it? How many of us would have faced this pandemic in the same way if we didn't have some financial reserves? And yet there are literally millions of people in Britain still today who don't even have a bank account. I find that scarcely credible, that you can live your life in the world without a bank account. And there are millions of people who have got no reserves. I think the statistic I saw was that there are at least 4 million people who do not have 500 pounds to their name. That's what they are having to endure the pandemic with. So the fourth section from verses 14 to 15, Joel says, this is what we need to do. We need to declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. We need to come before God and plead with him to change our reality. I think that even 20 years ago at the General Assembly, there would have been people who were saying that, agitating for that, saying that this is where we need to go. We need to come before God in humility and faith and plead with Him to bless the church. But we're not even in that place. I don't think I heard more than a single voice saying that at the General Assembly. And the person who was saying it was quickly closed down because it was getting in the way of the business. That's what we need to do. And I am still planning for the day when we are able to have everyone back in church and for that to be a time when we can do two things. We can give thanks. And we can intercede with God for our nation and for the church. We've got great schemes to do things outside, even if we can't do them inside. And if we get to that point, I hope that when we say we're going to meet in the park, whichever park it is, or in the car park, whichever car park it is, that we'll come in droves 
because we want to be a witness to our community that the church is still here. And then we come to the final section from verse 16. You'll be glad about that. You'll be thinking, don't pick any passages that have got five sections ever again. From verse 16, this is what he says, has not the food been cut off before your very eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The response to that is that even the cattle are moaning because they are hungry. That's one of the most powerful images anywhere, I think, in the Old Testament. How the cattle moan. That's, this is in verse 18. The herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. And what we need to do in verse 19, to you, O Lord, I call. To you alone, I call. And that is what we should be doing as Christians, calling out to God. Calling out to God for deliverance. Calling out to God for revival. Calling out for God to God for renewal. Calling out to God for hearts that are soft and fixed on him. And I'm looking forward to that day when we're, whether we're here or we're outside, we come together and we sing our songs of praise as we declare to our community that our God reigns. Let's pray together. Our Father, we see that the challenge of faith in the midst of adversity in this passage. We think of another passage which is familiar to us in the book of Psalms where by the river of Babylon your people sat down and wept. How can we sing the Lord's songs, they said, in a strange land? But for us, our Father, the longing we have is to sing our songs of praise in a place which is familiar and loved by us, whether it's in the church or in the streets of the village. How we long again to hear the name of Jesus exalted and lifted up and for us to enjoy the fellowship and the companionship and the friendship of our brothers and sisters as we look around and see the faces of those we love, singing together with us, how great thou art. Hear us, we pray, and continue with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just to get a flavor of what we're looking forward to, we're going to close with one of, I think, our most popular hymns, Love Divine. All loves excelling.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us and with all those whom we love this day and forevermore.